So I'd like you to please close your eyes. Please imagine someone from the Middle East. Really imagine their face and their clothes. Really imagine them eating and speaking. And really imagine their personality and their priorities. Thank you. I'd like to ask you two questions about this image. The first is, did you imagine someone very different from you? And the second is, where did that image come from? Now, far be it for me to answer this for all of us here, because each of you individually has a different experience, different background. But if I were to address this for the average American, I contend I know the answer. I contend that for the average American, the answer to question one is, yes, I absolutely envision someone very different than me. Not only do they look different and dress differently and eat different food, but I imagine them as very different fundamentally. They worry about different things, they have different priorities in life, they have different aspirations. I would imagine them as fundamentally different. And second, if I were to be truly honest with myself, the answer to question two would be, I got that image almost exclusively from the media. Years and years of watching and listening to the media has turned us into what I call label mongers. We are trained at consuming labels and conjuring up fictitious caricatures that are everything from really strange people to really scary people, things we're typically afraid of. What I'd like to share with you today is my personal story and my realization that I had become a label monger. So we'll start from the very beginning I was born in Cairo, Egypt in 1972. I did have hair once. <laughs> I think it lasted four years. I was <laughs> my mother was an electrical engineer, and my father was a colonel in the Air Force. I was raised in a, in a neighborhood called Heliopolis, which looks much like this picture taken 30 years ago, except with about eight more million cars jammed into, into the streets. I'm the oldest of three children, and yes, my brother and sister will kill me for showing this <laughs> in public, and it is now permanently there. Uh, we had a great childhood. We had a typical childhood. We did have the exception of uh, the fact that we got to travel on a couple of occasions, this being one of them. And you can tell that I'm uh, quite pissed off here. My mother would tell you that I'm upset because uh, I don't like being photographed. Uh, but I tell you it was likely because I was going to yet another museum I didn't want to see. <laughs> My sister was happy, though. <laughs> a few years. Uh, after that, uh, right before my 14th birthday, my whole family immigrated here to the U.S., uh, to Salt Lake City, Utah. We lived in these student apartments. Many of you will recognize them. They look exactly the same today as they did 30 years ago, <laughs> which is great. And when I arrived here, um, I knew I was a little different. I was raised elsewhere, but I don't think I quite appreciated how different Americans here perceived me. And I knew that based on the kinds of questions I would get asked. Questions I deemed really strange. Questions like, now you all ride camels in Egypt, right? Or do you have cars? And, you know, truth be told, I have ridden a camel once. And it was in Egypt as a tourist, but I hadn't at the time. Questions like, do you let girls go to school? But perhaps the most difficult, most divisive question I used to get asked was, why do your people hate us so much? And I remember having no idea what to say to that question, or what basis people had for, that, for believing that an entire nationality hated them. We wanted to fit in. We wanted to be just like everybody else. And with my parents' permission, my brother and I took on nicknames, Western nicknames. And we used to watch American TV shows, so I picked Mark Harris, Man from Atlantis. If you're 45 or older, you remember that show. Uh, my brother got a way cooler name, Steve Austin, six million dollar man. <laughs> he wins, he wins. We just wanted to fit in, and I'll tell you, those nicknames were very valuable. Because 10 or 15 years later, when I'd apply for a job, and I'd put Mark Salem on the top of my resume, I'd hear from eight out of the 10 applications I submitted to. If I replaced that Mark with a Bassam, 
Suddenly, they had no idea how to say my last name, and I'd be lucky to hear from two of them. So it was amazing. We just wanted to fit in. The strange thing is, as we began to fit in, and as people got to know us, the questions did go away, but then I'd get a strange reaction, and the reaction was, yeah, but you're not a typical Arab. You're not a typical Middle Easterner. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm pretty sure I have 30 cousins in Egypt who would beg to differ, they're just like me. Now let's go forward to 2001, a great year for me. I married my best friend, and I still had hair. Um, and I have to give credit to my little sister, who was her best friend first. It was a great year that ended quite in, a, in, in, in tough times for me. We all remember what happened in 2001, and I was a consulting manager at the time, so I traveled all over the country. And I distinctly remember the last few months of the year getting on a plane after 9-11. And let's not talk about security, that's not what I'm here to mention. I remember distinctly a situation where I was getting on the plane on a 757, and I can hear all sorts of chatter on the plane. And as soon as I walked in, and as soon as people had a glance at me, uh, at me the entire plane went completely silent. And I remember walking quietly to my chair, sitting down, and wanting to disappear in my chair at that point. I was too nervous to even stand up and go to the bathroom, not being sure exactly what would happen if I approached the cockpit. And I remember wanting to stand up and shout at the top of my lungs, people, what the hell are you afraid of? I'm just like you. I don't mean anybody any harm. It was at that point that I really realized, despite the fact that I'd been here this long, despite the fact that I'd seen myself as an Arab American, that I was a label and I was seen as different. 2002 brought yet another good news. I became a dad, and yes, I still had hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my son's birth, my first son's birth, uh, really brought me some introspection. Um, I, I, I really started thinking about things like uh, what he would think of me as he grew up. And it was at that point, and in discussions with my parents, that I realized that if my son hears my friends and colleagues at work refer to me by one name, and my friends and family at home refer to me by another name, that that might be less than a signal of authenticity. And it was at that point that I did something that was really difficult for me. I walked into the office and told the people with whom I'd worked for many years that I'd no longer wanted to be called by the nickname they knew me as, and to call me Bessam. And I'm sure they thought I was crazy. I'm sure they thought it was a political statement when it was really a personal one. But second, I really wanted to teach him about his Egyptian half, and to teach him some Arabic, a language I hadn't spoken for 20 years, and something I wanted to learn so I could teach him, or relearn so I could teach him. So I did that, and I did that by subscribing to all sorts of international TV channels and listening to Arabic music and, and so on, hoping that I can watch the news in Arabic and be able to get an idea of the language again. Not much after that, you'll all remember the images that you see here, images from the war with Iraq. And this talk is not about whether the war was right or wrong, that's beside the point. What's important to note is these are the kinds of images we all remember, images of oil fields burning, statues toppling, uh, surgical strikes. We all remember them very, very well. What was really interesting was it didn't really matter if you were watching Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. It seemed like they were all playing a trailer for a summer blockbuster movie called Operation Iraqi Freedom. It's almost as if all of them had lost all of their copywriters. They were all using the same copy, the same taglines, was kind of crazy. But even stranger than that is what I was seeing on the international channels. What I was seeing on the international channels were images and stories that were so much more devastating, so much more personal, so much more painful to see. I remember thinking, what would people think in our country here if they saw this stuff? How would they feel? I remember thinking, you know, while we think that Fox News and CNN are such polar opposites here in the States, when you pull out and look at a global scale, they might as well be the same station. They're not that different. It was at this point that I started losing my faith in the media. It was at this point that I realized that while our media might be free, 
It's not without bias and it's not without cost. Only a few years later, I got to go back to Egypt, this time as a tourist, yes. <laughs> um, great trip, but I was, I was a bit tepid. I was going back for the very first time in 20 years. I had last been there as a kid. I didn't know what to expect. Would I relate to the people of my home country? How would they treat me? How would they feel about me as an American with my American family? The war with Iraq was still going on. I was, in all sincerity, a little nervous. I was a little scared. I didn't know what to expect. The good news was I was utterly shocked. I was utterly shocked because as I met friends and family, as I walked the streets, talked to shopkeepers, talked to people in coffee shops, talked to cab drivers who drove us around, I was shocked at the fact that they talked about exactly the same things that we talk about in coffee shops here. That people's concern wasn't about my Americanism or hating Americans. People's discussion points were the economy, whether their kids were going to have better futures than they would, whether their car was going to work the next day. That was what was of concern to them. That was what mattered. So I had a bit of an epiphany at this point. And my epiphany had three components. The first was that I am what I consume. And for apparently for 20 years, I had been consuming one dimension of data. And if I consume one dimension of data, I become a one-dimensional human being. That I'm not only a typical Arab, I'm a typical human. And that humans are far more alike than they are different, and are only separated by three things genetics, customs, and circumstances. All three of these things are skin deep, all three of them are superficial. And the final one, as trite as this might sound, I can make a difference by being true to me. I can make a difference by saying, my name is Bassam, I'm an Egyptian, I'm an Arab, I'm a good guy, and I'm typical. My challenge to you is to do three things. My challenge to you is to first, Triangulate the truth. Don't trust the single sources of media you're using today and depending on today. Go for second sources of media, perhaps for it, from international channels. And even then, go to third sources of media, independent media sources, even those that people refer to as conspiracy theories. Because the painful truth is never self-evident. The, the painful truth is never out there. You have to go seek it. Second, Forget good versus evil. The world is not a James Bond movie. The world is not black and white. I still remember my younger son um, uh, saying, hey, Bala, as he calls me, uh, is that guy on the news, is he the bad guy? And I remember not being sure what to say. So all I could say was, well, son, yeah, yes, on this channel, he is the bad guy, he's the villain. But if you change the channel, um, he's actually the good guy, the protagonist. It really just depends what movie you're watching, because after all, that's all the news seems to be. It's a movie. Forget good versus evil. And finally, I challenge you to destroy labels. To destroy labels not just by not using them, but to destroy labels by stopping others from using them and letting them know that they're not relevant. Because I think we can all agree a label can't describe an entire race or nationality. How could it? It can't describe a, a country, a city. It can't describe a neighborhood. I'd argue it can't even describe a family. A family's gonna be captured by a label? So if a label isn't good enough to capture that granularity, what good is it? I hope that someday, when I walk into an audience like this and ask people to imagine someone from the Middle East, that while they might picture a fellow like the nice guy here who did give me my first camel ride in Egypt, that while they might say, say that, yes, he dresses differently, and yes, his skin color is different, and his habits and circumstances are different, that they might realize that deep down, he's not that different than the guy down the street. That deep down, he just has to think about the fact that he has to commute between two and three hours a day each way from his rural uh, location in, in, in Egypt, so he can work for 12 to 14 hours giving rides to people like me, all in the hope that his son doesn't have to do it. That that's what he thinks about, that that's what his priorities are, that's what preoccupies him. It's not hating Americans. 
I invite you to join me in building bridges instead of destroying them with labels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.